Hey, welcome back to Slow Bells. Today I'm in Sarasota, Florida on a very blustery afternoon. We had a thunderstorm come through at dawn this morning and the wind shifted around to the north and it is now blowing with enthusiasm. I'm not really used to having thunderstorms in the month of December, but I guess if you're in Florida, it's maybe the new normal? I don't know. I guess I'll find out. Today I'm going to take you along the portion of the Great Loop trip from Mobile, Alabama to Sarasota, Florida along the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. Check it out! In order to get from Mobile, Alabama to Sarasota, Florida, you will need to pass through a variety of different boating environments. The first part of the trip and the last part of the trip will be very similar to the ICW on the East Coast, where a series of bays are connected to each other by either rivers or canals. There are no locks in this portion of the Great Loop. The middle portion of the trip will not have these protected waterways, so you will have to take your boat out into the Gulf of Mexico. Let's zoom in on this area for a minute. By the way, this middle area where you have to go out in the Gulf of Mexico is sometimes referred to as the armpit of Florida because of its shape. There are two ways that loopers typically deal with this Gulf of Mexico portion of the trip. Method one is to go from Carabel directly to the Tarpon Springs area in one shot. This will require you to be out in the open waters of the Gulf of Mexico overnight, unless you have a boat that goes a whole lot faster than my boat goes. Method two is to break the trip into four smaller segments, each of which will require you to go out into the open waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Each segment can be done in daylight hours at seven and a half knots, but some of them will be long days. I chose to do the four shorter hops, but there are advantages and disadvantages to either option. I spent several days at Turner Marine in Mobile, Alabama. My new shipmate, Johan, joined me there. Also, I was able to fix my generator problem by having the generator starter rebuilt. One of the more interesting places we went for a meal was Mudbug's Restaurant. It wasn't the most healthy meal I have ever had, but the food was fine, and we got to listen to Zydeco music while we ate lunch, which was kind of fun. After several days, we eventually headed back out into Mobile Bay. Mobile Bay is huge, and it took us all morning to get across it. There was nothing much to look at except shrimp boats and the occasional oil rig. We anchored for the night near Orange Beach. The real estate values we were passing by were obviously going up. You just don't see a lot of houses like this on the Tom Bigby waterway. Later in the day, we ended up at another anchorage next to Spectre Island. On the following day, we passed through the Pensacola area and ended up at anchor once again on the east side of Choctawatchee Bay. It was on this day that I watched two dolphins near my boat jump four feet out of the water in perfect formation. It was one of those wow moments. The next day, we zigzagged through Panama City and eventually anchored out in the boonies once again, this time in Walker Bayou.
Another day's travel took us to Apalachicola. I originally intended to grab a marina slip in town, but the town looked so small, I decided to wait another day before checking into a marina. So, we anchored once again. The next morning was pretty foggy, but the fog burned off by the time we got the anchor up. Now, only a very thin barrier island separated us from the Gulf of Mexico. We checked into Moorings of Carabel Marina that afternoon to take on fuel, pump out the sewage tanks, let Johan do some of his laundry, and we visited the local grocery store. We also had a meal in town with one of our fellow loopers. Carabel is where the offshore portion of the Great Loop trip begins. For us, that meant four days of traveling out in the Gulf of Mexico and anchoring at the end of the day. The first hop would be Carabel to Stenachi. Hop number two would be Stenachi to Cedar Key. Hop three would be Cedar Key to Crystal River. And finally, hop four would be Crystal River to Tarpon Springs, which is near the Tampa area. We left Carabel the following morning before first light although it was getting light as we left Dog Island to port and headed out into the Gulf of Mexico. A north wind made for a somewhat miserable passage during the morning hours, but by lunchtime things had started to improve and the afternoon portion of our cruise was very nice. During the bumpy morning segment of our passage, a bottle of dishwashing detergent fell into the galley sink and partially drained. I cleaned up the mess and I really didn't give it much more thought. But later, when I returned to the galley, I discovered the bubble monster was taking over the galley. After getting our fair share of abuse in the Gulf of Mexico, we anchored in Stenachi a little before dinner time. It was Thanksgiving Day and nothing appeared to be open in town. So we had dinner on the boat and got a good night's sleep. The following day we headed over to Cedar Key. I think this was the shortest of our four hops out in the Gulf of Mexico. Cedar Key was a very exposed area to be anchoring in, but in light winds it worked out just fine. Johan tried out the dinghy and headed into town to explore. His legs were so long that they barely fit inside the dinghy. The next day, a longer trip took us to Crystal River. I tried to get a slip at Pete's Pier Marina, but they didn't have any room for us. So we grabbed an empty mooring ball out in the anchorage in Kings Bay. We would have to remain here a few days because stronger winds were in the forecast. Johan and I took the dinghy into town the next morning for a corned beef hash breakfast, followed by some grocery shopping. We parked the dinghy at Hunter Springs Park. This area had unusually clear water, and commercial entrepreneurs would outfit tourists with wetsuits so they could swim with the manatees. Johan and I saw a manatee by the boat ramp, but we did not join the manatee for a swim. However, a swim was looking much more likely when Johan and I headed back to Slow Bells in the dinghy. The wind had finally arrived and was now blowing with enthusiasm. Johan and I had to split up to get back to the boat. I rode the dinghy partway back to Slow Bells, then accepted a tow from one of our anchorage neighbors who had an outboard motor on his dinghy. Johan managed to find a ride in a different powerboat at Pete's Pier Marina. After Johan and I were both back on slow bells, I decided to take a swim to check out our mooring ball, and I was horrified to discover how corroded the steel ring was that we were tied to. Shame on me for not taking a closer look much, much sooner. We ended up abandoning the mooring ball and anchoring for the next couple nights. I trusted my ground tackle much more than I trusted that mooring ball. While we were waiting for the wind to die down, I guess the raw water strainer for my generator got in the mood for some salad. Our fourth and final offshore hop 
happened after the winds finally settled down. This hop would take us from Crystal River to the Tarpon Springs area. We had to move offshore to find water depths that I was comfortable with. At one point, we were 14 miles off the coast in 14 feet of water. Now, how outrageous is that? I chose not to go into the town of Tarpon Springs. Instead, Johan and I anchored once again, this time behind a barrier island called Anklot Key. It was another very exposed anchorage, but it gave us protection from the northwest wind that was blowing at that time. By this point, we had finally successfully traveled around the armpit of Florida, and I was looking forward to cruising through more protected areas. By late morning, we were passing under the many drawbridges in the Clearwater, Florida area, which is on the west side of Tampa. I tried to make a marina reservation in the St. Petersburg area, but both marinas I contacted had no slips. This is the busy season for the Florida boating community, and to make life even more complicated for a transient boater like me, they were having their annual boat show. So no empty transient slips. I finally opted for Plan B, which was to cross Tampa Bay and anchor near the mouth of the Manatee River, a few miles downstream from the town of Bradenton. This was a little bit of a trip down memory lane for me. When I purchased my last sailboat years ago, I spent a few months in Bradenton outfitting it before sailing off for the Bahamas. I never, ever expected to be back in the Manatee River, but here I was again. Sometimes life just plays tricks on you. The following day was our last day on the road to Sarasota, Florida. We had been warned of shallow water along this stretch of the Gulf ICW, so we were extra careful to stay in the middle of the channel. And we did just fine with Slow Bell's four-foot draft. In Sarasota, my shipmate Johan would return to his home in California. I decided to remain in Sarasota through the winter. I moved to a mooring ball maintained by the people at Marina Jack. To get to town, I would hop in my dinghy and row to the Marina Jack dinghy dock. I could use the marina bathrooms, laundry, and sewage pump-out facilities, and most of the stores I needed to visit were within walking distance of the marina. That's all I've got for you this time. The next segment of this video series around the Great Loop will be, for me, the final segment. I'll be going from Sarasota to uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where I will end my Great Loop trip. But I think I'm going to stick around here for the winter here in Sarasota. Maybe try to get out of here around the 1st of April. Of course, with me, I never really know for sure what I'm doing the next day until the next day gets here. So, we'll see what happens. Hope you enjoyed the video. Later!